Notre époque connaît des changements sans précédent. L'activité humaine augmente, les villes s'étendent. Aujourd'hui, plus que jamais, l'eau a besoin de nous. Le traitement de l'eau, c'est notre responsabilité. Une histoire d'hommes, de femmes, faite d'engagement et de savoir-faire. C'est notre histoire au SIAP. Nous collectons, transportons et dépolluons les eaux usées de 9 millions de franciliens. Notre réseau de 440 km de canalisation est géré en temps réel, avec des outils de prévision et de régulation qui nous permettent d'anticiper toutes les situations et d'optimiser la gestion des flux. 7 jours sur 7, 24 heures sur 24. Chaque jour, dans nos usines, nous traitons 2,5 millions de mètres cubes d'eau usée. Grâce à un savoir-faire et des équipements uniques en Europe. Notre vision est durable, tournée vers le long terme. Nous nous engageons à développer notre activité industrielle de manière responsable. Nous investissons régulièrement dans la modernisation de nos usines et dans le développement de solutions innovantes et protectrices de l'environnement. Chacun de nous, dans son métier, se sent porteur du service public et de l'intérêt général, au service de notre mission la préservation du milieu naturel et de la biodiversité. Au SIAP, nous sommes fiers d'être une entreprise publique forte de 40 ans d'expérience au service de l'agglomération parisienne. Et nous sommes plus de 1700 agents à partager cet engagement et cette passion. Pour aujourd'hui et pour demain.
morning, good afternoon, dear participants, depending on where you are. It is a great pleasure to welcome you in this one table entitled Enhancing Residues in Blue Cities of the Second International Conference on Water, Megacities and Global Change. The session chair is Oriana Romano, who is the head of unit at the OECD. Mrs. Romano, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I'm Mariana Romano and I'm heading the OECD Water Governance and Circular Economy Unit. I'm very delighted to welcome you all at the second International UNESCO Conference on Water Megacities and Global Change, and especially to this session on enhancing resilience in blue cities. So use the platform, don't hesitate to let you know from where you are connected from and to share any questions you may have. We will try to be as interactive as possible during these one hour and a half together. It is now time to hear from our amazing panelists of today. We will hear from international organizations and cities on how to enhance a sustainable and resilient blue economy. Um, I'm happy to introduce now Aziz Akmush, Head of Division of Cities, Urban Policies and Sustainable Development, and also, as you all know, the initiator of the OECD Water Governance Programme for her opening remarks. So Aziz, uh, thank you very much for being with us. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Oriana. And let me uh, first have a word for our colleagues at UNESCO, uh, Abu Amani and Alice Aureli, uh, with whom we've been working for over a decade on these very important issues on, on related to water. And I would like to congratulate you for the fantastic conference you've been organizing this week. It's, uh, it's good to be back uh, in the, Incroyable in the water que vous organisez cette semaine. I would like to share with you some of the takeaways um, that have uh, come. Uh, and I'm hearing the interpretation, sorry, just to, uh, to be clear. I'm hearing the interpretation, even if it's off, if we can fix uh, this technically so that I can deliver my remarks. Thank you. Um, so I, I'm, I'm happy to be back uh, and actually share with you some of the takeaways that have come out of work uh, we uh, did on water in the past decade and that are shaping uh, a kind of a new approach we are launching these days on, on what we call cities for the blue economy and there are three three main messages i'd like to share with you today the, the first one is that at the oecd as an economic multidisciplinary organization we've been very vocal that there can actually not be economic resilience without water resilience um, it's been pretty clear uh, to us for over a decade that water is not just a sectoral resource related issue but actually a driver for economic development and when we bring this to the subnational level, you can make a very similar observation that uh, cities that are actually not waterproof, water wise, water secure, are cities that cannot contribute uh, to a sustainable development and, and what we call a blue economy in the sense that they deliver economic growth, jobs, and ecosystem services. And the two main uh, things we've been looking at under that, that message recently is that although uh, the issue, the, the challenge, the opportunities related to the blue economy have been traditionally approached uh, as a national and international issues, they do have a number of territorial impacts. The first one is because a number of these blue economy activities, whether we're talking about tourism, uh, fishing, uh, uh, marine biotechnology research and so on are actually taking place and providing employment at the very local level um, and they should on their own actually contribute to over a third uh, of the blue economy benefits and bring a number of related employment and uh, economic benefits at the very local level. And at the OECD five years ago, we actually estimated that the ocean economy on its own is, is likely to employ over 40 million uh, people. And what we've seen recently with this COVID-19 pandemic is that there's, there's a, a sort of urban paradigm shift whereby many cities are uh, trying to turn what used to be threats and vulnerabilities um, during the, the pandemic and lockdown uh, 
things that used to be assets and turned into vulnerabilities, such as being, for example, a port city or, or the position in global value chains when uh, tourism was basically stopped and, uh, and the number of ecosystem services were at stake. These vulnerabilities were very quickly turned into um, sources of attractiveness that are likely to boost uh, the blue economy in the future. So that's a very uh, first point on, let's say, the growth potential of water security at the very local level. And at the same time, and that's a bit the flip side of the coin, we see um, from a governance stand uh, stand uh, stand standpoint, sorry, how many of these um, uh, uh, cities and, and, and local governments are increasing uh, their attention to water security and making sure that they're addressing what we call the different water risks uh, now and, and in the future. We know, for example, that by 2050, over 500 low-lying coastal cities are going to face um, sea level rise. Um, this is going to put almost 800 million people at risk and generate trillions of dollars of, uh, of damages from an economic standpoint. We've seen also, and the statistics and projections we produce at the OECD, that 4 billion people will actually live in water-stressed areas by 2050, and we know that one in two inhabitants worldwide currently live in a city, and this is where also some of the competition over water uses are uh, mostly felt. We've seen to which extent scarcity has turned into a very hot potato for many mega cities worldwide. Our Secretary General flagged it earlier this week, uh, how droughts have been affected, uh, China's technology hub, uh, Shenzhen, how Australia's capital city, Canberra, and Brazil's economic powerhouses, whether we're talking about Rio or Sao Paulo, have also been uh, going through unique uh, droughts in their history. And we know this is holding potential impacts at the economic level because it's, it's undermining somehow the economic growth potential of, of those mega cities. And finally, pollution itself that uh, not only limits economic growth uh, by up to a third, but also affects the billions of people that rely on the ocean uh, to uh, provide jobs and food. So the first point is really that connection between water resilience, um, water security, and the blue economy and all the economic direct and indirect benefits that water generates at the local level. And now the good news, and that's the second point, is that cities have actually a very important role to play uh, to, to bolster that blue economy and to manage water-related risks. Whether we are in a very centralized or very decentralized institutional context, all the work we've been doing on water governance shows that they hold very important prerogatives at the local level that can make change happen because a number of the decisions that are affecting water security are actually taken outside the water box. It's interesting to see how mayors and local uh, levels have important policy prerogatives, for example, in the areas of land use or in spatial planning or waste management that are affecting not only the growth uh, potential of a city, but also the water security um, itself and and when we know that 80 uh, percent of marine pollution is actually coming from land-based sources such as untreated uh, sewage then we and if you include plastics on top of that then we see to what extent this is important but in addition to the policy prerogative there's an, another big component where they make change happen which is investment uh, the data we have at the oecd shows that 64 percent of the public investment and over 55 percent of the public spending that goes uh, to climate and environmental areas are actually discharged by local and regional governments. And that means there's a, a very important role to be played at local level to make sure that those investments are going really to areas that can address resilience and, and water security and not worsen the climate change um, that, that itself is exacerbating a number of these risks. And that's why uh, we have come up with uh, this new project on, on cities for a blue economy that is uh, ad advocating, let's say, for what we call a risk-proof approach uh, to water security and, and sustainable growth. Um, 
The R is for resilience to all types of shocks and, and risks that are going to exacerbate. The I is for inclusion, not only uh, to provide job opportunities, but also to address targeted vulnerable groups. The S, of course, for sustainability from an environmental standpoint by preserving, amongst others, uh, natural ecosystems. And the C for circular to limit greenhouse gas emissions, to reduce um, uh, resource extraction by closing material loops uh, to address pollution, including from plastics, and to uh, recover uh, resources from, from wastewater. And that takes me to the final point of my intervention to say that this uh, risk-proof uh, blue economy that we are advocating for and that is uh, opening the way for a new um, a stream of work that the OECD will be uh, devoted to over the, the next two years is uh, borrowing a lot and drawing extensively on this decade of work on water governance, where, for example, the, the piece of legislation we adopted over five years ago, the OECD principles on water governance have been instrumental in supporting uh, cities, basing countries, manage these risks of too much, too little, too polluted water, but also supply and provide universal access to drinking uh, water and sanitation by looking not only at the what to do, but how to do it and who is actually doing what. And there's one of these principles in particular that, that I believe holds importance for that work on, on the blue economy and cities, which is the one related to the scale. Because we know that cities are not islands. They shouldn't act in isolation. There is a very clear mismatch. UNESCO and many others in this panel have been advocating for that uh, between hydrological boundaries and administrative boundaries that really call for that functional city basin approach to, to water management. And that also applies when we're uh, looking beyond freshwater and, and addressing ocean um, related items for that blue economy. So we hope uh, this work will add value uh, over the coming years. We're uh, absolutely keen to partner with as many uh, stakeholders as uh, interested. And I uh, wish you today an excellent panel. I look forward to the uh, discussion with our uh, guest uh, panelists in, in a few minutes. Thank you very much, Aziza, for your opening remarks and for uh, launching once again after COP26 the OECD project on uh, cities for the blue economy. What I get from your speech is that there is no economic resilience without water resilience, so a sustainable blue economy in cities can happen if we fix and prevent water risks, that cities have an important role to play, but we don't have to forget the role that they play together with the basin so it is important to get as you highlighted the water governance right for sustainable blue economies but also at the right scale and i'm very happy that today we will be having three cities that will share their own experiences in approaching developing and implementing sustainable blue economy at local level in connection with their basins so thank you very much for your opening remarks I will now pass the floor and welcome uh, Cassil de Brenier. Uh, Cassil is the Deputy Director of Operation at the French Development Agency. AFD uh, worked uh, extensively on uh, oceans, or on blue economy. So Cassil, the, the floor is yours uh, to share your experience uh, and to uh, uh, describe the work that you have been doing uh, within this field. The floor is yours. Merci beaucoup, Oriana. Uh, Thank you very much, Oriana. I today would like to talk to you a little bit about what uh, the uh, um, FDA does in France, but also extend it and mention a little oceans. Oceans are very important because uh, they uh, host 90% of world biodiversity and they're at the very core of uh, climate change. They absorb 80% of uh, um, heat and uh, they produce uh, uh, and they uh, also produce oxygen and uh, use uh, up carbon dioxide. It is what makes oceans are what make our planet habitable. 
We haven't looked a lot at the oceans over as much as we should have over the last few years, but it is part of the water sector as well. As, as I said, water is not just a sector. It is actually one of the determining factors that can determine or that can uh, slow down life and development. So in the FDA, we take a, a, a specific look as well at oceans. Now, oceans are, as Aziza said, a source of climate, biodiversity, food, jobs, health. Oceans are the very basis that will allow us to uh, achieve for the SDGs, particularly SDG 14 on marine biodiversity, which I would like to talk about today. In the FDA, we adopted an ocean strategy to highlight the role of oceans as uh, a space of uh, global life, but also as a space or an area that is threatened. We have uh, the uh, disappearance of uh, many aquatic uh, species, and since 2020, 6.5 percent of our activities are given over to oceans. It's about 827 million euros in 2020, 83 percent for climate and the rest for biodiversity. And uh, of course, we have also included in this all of the blue economy everything that can be done for ports, for fishing, for coastlines, for tourism, telecom, aquaculture. As a uh, development bank, a public development bank, we try to directly finance projects that are going to allow us uh, to preserve the oceans, but also to carry with us, to federate around us, uh, because uh, alone we cannot do it, to federate our peers. We very shortly, as a public development bank, are going to be signing the principles for development of uh, sustainable blue economies so that we can factor in some of the impacts on marine ecosystems in our investments. Uh, we have what we call the climate finance, uh, we want to have ocean finance, and we also want to involve the private sector development banks will not alone be able to tackle this challenge. We need the involvement of local players, municipalities, big cities, and it is extremely important that all of uh, the actions that are done uh, by these towns along their coastlines be able to contribute and be able to uh, factor in the health and the preservation of oceans. So we are always asking ourselves as to the compatibility of the development of coastlines and uh, preserving the oceans, be it uh, uh, along uh, riverways, waterways uh, as well. Uh, a lot of the future of oceans is actually played out uh, on land. Uh, the issues of waste, issues of sanitation, sewerage, we want to deal with all of that. And I would also like to take a closer look at what we call uh, clean oceans. Uh, this is the issue of plastics. We are trying to look at some of the subjects or the topic or the issues that are the hardest to actually solve. Uh, it is very uh, difficult to know exactly uh, how to tackle this for uh, sewerage, uh, for sanitation. There are uh, many actors who are already uh, uh, active in that sector, but it's not always the case uh, for plastics. We've got the Casa de Vosito the, in Spain. We've got uh, the European Union as well, who have federated in this clean ocean project. Uh, 300 million tons of plastic are produced every year. Eight to ten finish uh, in the oceans uh, through rivers and along coastlines. And this phenomenon is accentuated by the uh, demographic increase in a lot of the coastal towns, particularly in developing countries. And if we continue like this, so we consider that uh, uh, very shortly there will be more plastic in the ocean than there will be fish. 
750 million tons of plastic will be in the oceans. So this is something that uh, this is a, a, a challenge, a threat that has not fully been taken into account. Every year, 300,000 tons of plastics are floating on the surface of the oceans. And that is less than 1% of the plastic that is actually present in the uh, oceans. 99% that remains is uh, broken down into microparticles that cannot be digested by fish. If we want to preserve these oceans, uh, if we want to, to uh, slow down this proliferation of plastic, we must do something. Humanity generates more than two billion uh, in uh, tons of waste uh, every year, so it is up to us uh, to uh, confront this challenge with all of our partners. It truly is a, a great threat today. It's a great challenge. We're going to do the best we can. Uh, about one quarter of humanity does not have any uh, system of wastewater treatment, and less than half of the world population has a, an, an adequate sewerage or sanitation system. We've been working in the sector of solid waste since the beginning of 2010, and between 2010 to 2020, we've had more than 60 projects, more than uh, 500 uh, uh, thousand euros. So we have to tackle the source of these uh, problems, producing less pr plastic, favoring the circular economy. This is one of the uh, issues of the Clean Ocean, the 2018 Clean Ocean Project. The objective was to finance two billion for oceans. And today, we already have 36 projects to the amount of 1.59 billion investment set aside. Let me just give you two or three examples. We financed, for example, uh, amongst the uh, projects, the Lomé Waste Treatment Center. Lomé is a great coastal city, of course. So that's one example of what we have done. We have uh, financed 21 million euros between the uh, AFD, the uh, U European Union, and others. They also delegated funds to us. And we also are working a lot on sanitation. But we have several projects, one that I would like to point out on recycling uh, plastics in the Caribbean. There we are working uh, in raising awareness but also collecting and involving the populations uh, living in the towns on uh, uh, raising their awareness as to producing less plastics and recycling it. Thank you very much, and uh, I will answer any questions should you have any. Thank you very much, uh, Casilde. the importance of the connection between cities and oceans. I took note of the 2020 ocean strategy, the principles for public finance on sustainable economy, which include the finance climate and finance ocean. You highlighted this uh, uh, initiative started in 2018 on the clean ocean, focusing on the plastics, uh, given that 80% uh, of actually the plastic that is uh, uh, ending in the ocean is actually produced on land. So cities are very much responsible of what is happening, whether they are coastal cities, river cities. So everybody has to take his own responsibility, but through the Clean Ocean uh, uh, Initiative, uh, together with many partners, so you are basically helping cities uh, and um, uh, helping cities, uh, big, medium, and small cities, uh, to increase uh, solid waste management and to prevent basically uh, plastic uh, uh, ending up in the oceans. So we will be going back to uh, some of the details, and uh, perhaps uh, you can tell us more uh, about this initiative uh, during the discussion. I will now uh, pass the floor to uh, uh, our colleague uh, Alice Aureli. Alice is the Chief of Section uh, Groundwater System and Settlement at UNESCO. So UNESCO is the 
host organization of this conference. So we're very honored and happy to have you, Alice, with us today. And so we would like to hear from you about uh, how UNESCO can help linking uh, this uh, uh, important subject and topic of cities. So, so mega cities we're talking today within this conference and a sustainable blue economy, resilient blue economy. Please, uh, the floor is yours. I know you have some slides, huh? you have some slides yes, to share. Yes. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Oriana, and uh, it's a pleasure to be, to be with you. And the first thing I want to say is uh, UNESCO is ready without risk to work with the OECD in the risk-proof approach for uh, resilience uh, in, uh, in announcing resilience in blue cities. We are teaming on the water governance since many, many years. So new challenges, uh, of course, in front of us uh, are, are ready and we are ready to go. Um, well, uh, um, I, I will say something that I think everybody expects from UNESCO, because part of the role of UNESCO Intergovernmental Ecologic uh, Program is uh, to constitute a network where the UNESCO Order family, member states, HP national committees, and its centers and chairs and partners share and generate uh, new knowledge. One of the aims uh, definitely is to make uh, emerge uh, new ideas, uh, and this is um, very relevant uh, to see the development of concepts such as the blue cities that looks at water security together with blue ocean economy and fresh water economy. First slide, uh, please. The solution scheme for water challenges in cities really to, to say difficult uh, to, to implement anyway. In, in the past years, uh, I3, the UNESCO I3 has been looking at complementary approaches in order to integrate uh, the resilient cities and climate change related solutions, but also other integrated solutions with better consideration of, of water. Concepts of a resilient city smart cities are representing solutions with large coverage, but water-related problems they discuss remain general and not really detailed. So we, we really look at to, to, to have a better, I mean, uh, uh, an integrated approach. Next slide. <coughs> of course, uh, what is the main issue of UNESCO? In this framework, UNESCO actions include uh, and give priority to knowledge development, knowledge development for practitioners and decision makers. Uh, I give you an example, a recent one, uh, something we are very proud of. Um, the Global Water Security Issue Series that is promoted by UNESCO together with uh, IWRA and our UNESCO Category 2 centers in Korea, the International Center for Water Security and Sustainable Management. Uh, one of the publications uh, published uh, two years ago considered the, the, the topic of the circular economy and water reuse with several chapters, as you can expect from me, of interest in the context of mega cities. The last issues that has been just published last year in December and launched during the IWRA Congress in Korea focused on groundwater. And definitely we are ready to go very much more on looking at the groundwater role in cities and mega cities this year and next year. So, um, now we, we are preparing a new book on making water decisions for climate change adaptation and the call for contribution is available and I can share, of course, the link if you ask me to do it. Next slide. Well, seal of excellence for urban water management. I think we are all looking at that. It's, it's definitely uh, an interested, uh, interesting concept. And um, well, the UNESCO activities have taken, of course, uh, into consideration this uh, these approach, the seal of excellence for urban water management. Why is because apparently this has revealed uh, a huge potential to develop an integrated view by looking within the city and beyond the city. Looking at water from source to tap, so to look at how 
minimize uh, carbon footprint and reduce plastic waste and thus contribute indirectly to several SDGs, uh, SDG 6, of course, and SDGs 14, uh, SDG 3, 12, uh, and 17. I mean, let me say that, of course, talking about ocean, as you know, um, the EU and General Assembly has mandated uh, the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission of UNESCO to lead the Ocean Decade that started last year, 2021, process to 2030. So, I mean, uh, in, in UNESCO, we have uh, these, uh, these uh, really integrated approach to look from source to sea um, and the water role in particular uh, coastal cities uh, and and uh, and and uh, big big large uh, and mega cities. Um, uh, definitely, uh, the program uh, one of the programs that we are implementing uh, will be implemented with the WHO using their guidelines and standards with UN Habitat uh, using the GWOPA network of water and wastewater operators and with IWA experts uh, who will join UNESCO Water Family. To execute, uh, of course, uh, the training uh, session and the water education, education uh, and, and learning uh, approach and assessment. Next slide, please. Well, another activities, and I will give some examples uh, that the UNESCO Intergovernmental Hydrological Program is implementing uh, currently is, uh, well, a very challenging project, is a 10 years research project. Uh, focusing on strengthening water security in urban areas while considering the effects of climate change. Well, how we do it? I mean, we have selected 10 African cities and 10 Asian cities that will benefit from, from this approach and our work. Uh, the project is currently being implemented in Kenya, Gabon, Zambia in Africa, and in Bhutan, Timor Leste, and Uzbekistan in Asia. Um, in, in the slide, uh, we have uh, decided to, to present very rapidly, I mean, the time will not allow us to do more in detail, but uh, what we are doing in, in Nairobi, in Kenya. Um, there we are investiga investigating the use of urban groundwater in order to diversify the current water supply of the city that, of Nairobi that was not sufficient. And in doing so, we are looking at applying um, a strategy of management of aquifer recharge with treated wastewater to augment the aquifer resource, resource uh, volume. It's, of course, part of the water security project approach. Yes, next slide, please. Well, definitely the city blueprint framework and uh, um, in another key that UNESCO, UNESCO has also uh, teamed up with the key uh, WR Water Institute in Netherlands and uh, the University of Bath to cooperate in the Blue City approach developed by KWR as um, maybe, I mean, definitely, uh, I don't want to go into detail, you know, this is an interactive tool for strategic decision making about urban water looking on issues of water security in an urban framework. And, uh, and these, along with exploring governance elements that could cause challenges uh, and, and grasp uh, elements uh, of the city water cycle that are already sustainable, and the one uh, that which uh, will need to be adapted. Now, we are started, as you can see in, uh, in the slide, uh, um, considering a cooperation with several cities, in particular in Africa, um, Abidjan, Abuja, Bangui, I mean, you can read the slide. Well, having said that, um, well, ideally, blue cities uh, uh, have to share data and information, have to talk to each other. I mean, this is, uh, of course, UNESCO and I think OECD also main uh, objectives for, for the future to create uh, the capacity of city to, to learn from each other and, and consider the risks associated with their development. Uh, that is, uh, is why we are using, uh, for example, in UNESCO, the, the idea that we launched of the Mega Cities Alliance for Water and uh, Climate Platform. Uh, this platform to, should help to, to learn from each other and, and share 
lesson learned. I hope I take seven minutes and not more. Oriana, thank you. Thank, thank you, you. thank you very much, uh, Alice. Wow, that was a very rich presentation of, of several of the activities in seven minutes. I guess so you just had to make a, make a selection of the activities that uh, um, you are carrying out uh, on the urban uh, water and uh, the relation with the blue economy more specifically. I take a very uh, very gladly uh, the point on the collaboration with the OECD. We're very much looking forward to it. And just to summarize uh, some important point that you made on the support that UNESCO is uh, providing in terms of knowledge development, uh, either to very specific uh, issues. So there is a, an issue you mentioned on uh, making water decision for climate adaptation. The call is open. And so uh, I'm sure that interested people will reach you to know more uh, knowledge development, capacity building, the fact that within the UNESCO there is the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission leading the ocean decade, but you also mentioned beyond these uh, uh, technical work, the fact that uh, you also created a platform for city-to-city -city learning, so uh, supporting cities uh, with analytical guidance, uh, but also providing a platform for dialogue as it is important even though we know that solutions are very much a place based, the dialogue and the exchange of information and experience is very much key. And so you mentioned the Mega Cities Alliance for Water. I'm sure that all this information uh, is available on uh, sources and websites, but uh, uh, I invite the audience to share any question they may have, as we will be having time for the discussion later on. Thank you very much, uh, Alice. And now we are moving to uh, the, the part of this uh, um, uh, session uh, looking at uh, very much at the city's perspectives. So we move from the international organization, try to support the cities and local government in developing knowledge, capacities, and implementation to the ground. So we have the, today the pleasure of having with us the mayor of Kelimani City in Mozambique, Mr. Manuel Araujo. And we're very glad that Manuel could be with us today. Uh, we hoped to, to do this uh, conference uh, in presence. Instead, we are still on Zoom, but uh, very happy to have you here connected with us. So Manuel, the uh, floor is yours now to uh, share information about uh, how Kelly Manning Cities is dealing with freshwater marine resources towards a sustainable and resilient blue economy. Please. We cannot hear you. Not, uh, I think there is a, an issue with the sound. No, we can't hear you. Can you try without headset? Maybe you can unplug your uh, headphones, please. Just disconnect uh, the headphones and try again. Or change the microphone input. Apologies for this technical problem. Let's see if we can fix it. So if not, we, we are not able to hear you. Perhaps uh, while we fix this problem, uh, we can move on to the other city. And then, uh, Manuel, I'm coming back to you. So I will now introduce uh, the, the second city, um, Paris. So Paris, France, 
we have the pleasure to have uh, with us uh, Dan Lert, the deputy mayor in charge of the ecological transition, the climate plan, water and energy. And Dan is also the president of uh, Eau de Paris, uh, so Paris Water. And uh, we, I know we have also a PowerPoint presentation. So Dan, the floor is yours. Merci, merci beaucoup. Bonjour. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning to everybody. It's a great pleasure for me to be with you here today during this conference. Thank you for having invited me. And thank you to the colleagues from the other cities that are present uh, here with us today. We do have a presentation that we would like to show you today to talk to you about the role of water in Paris, our capital city. First slide, please. The presence of water in Paris is fundamental. It is something that allows us to hydrate ourselves, to drink, to refresh ourselves, but also to fight against what we call heat effects and to uh, reinforce the biodiversity in the Paris uh, region. Confronted with climate change, and we have uh, climate change forecasts in Paris that we are very familiar with, we have committed with the city to uh, enhance the role of water in the urban area. We're lucky enough to be able to lean on a, a very significant network of uh, non-drinkable water. That's one of the idiosyncrasies of the town of Paris. We have a lot of drinkable water, but also non-drinkable, and I'll get back to that a little later. Paris also has uh, uh, a, a very uh, big uh, network of uh, 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 for big uh, cultural institutions, uh, the Louvre, the uh, Maison de Radio France. We have a lot, uh, a, a, a very big uh, cooling system in Paris that is all linked to our river. We are continuing to create new swamps, new ponds, new little lakes, wet zones. They are breathing spaces. And the idea is to create 50 new wet zones between now and 2030 throughout the whole of the Paris area. Paris is also strongly committed to improving the quality of the water from its river. The efforts that we have made over the last few years have allowed us to develop quite a number of new activities in Paris, such as swimming in Paris. Swimming is a way of reappropriating our own river and our own uh, water. These spaces, of course, are essential to be able to refresh oneself uh, when it is hot. And uh, every year we have uh, bathing spaces that are installed in one of the um, canals in Paris the Canal de la Villette, and every year tons, uh, tens of thousands of young people and families, instead of leaving on holiday, actually stay in Paris and swim in these uh, bathing spaces. As you know, we have wanted to put our river at the very heart of the 2024 Olympic Games and Paralympic Games, which will be held in Paris. That's been quite a challenge, but it has meant that we have had a very... Um, um, uh, combative attitude, a, a go-get attitude for some of the uh, Olympic Games uh, sporting events that are going to be held in and around the river. And the fact that, the, that one will be able to swim in the river is going to be essential for, the, for Parisians and all of those living in the Ile-de-France region. We are also uh, undergoing a very important project at the moment for us. We would like to reopen a river, a river called the Bièvre, which is found to the south of Paris in the 13th district of Paris, if you want to be precise. This was a river that, flew be that fl uh, flowed before in Paris, but uh, has 
uh, with the Industrial Revolution sadly been changed into a type of open-air sewer. And today it has been deliberately uh, detoured to industrial areas before actually reaching Paris. We would like to reopen the Bievre River. We would like uh, to do what some other towns have done upstream of Paris. And in just a few years' time, the Bievre River will be flowing again. Open air uh, parts of the Bievre will be flowing through Paris. It is a great uh, plan for Paris to adapt to climate change, but it's also a big uh, urban planning project. It will also be another way of refreshing the city and to develop biodiversity, as well as being a solution to improve the living conditions of uh, the inhabitants who would like more nature in town and more water in towns. Next slide, please. The city of Paris owns some 1,300 uh, spaces, open air spaces. We have uh, sources, springs, catchment areas. Uh, we have uh, uh, drinkable water uh, basins around Orly, where we have a reserve, a storage reserve that is a preserved natural zone. In that zone, we would like to protect and uh, to reestablish a resilient ecosystem capable of uh, uh, tackling more extreme climate change conditions, such as extreme heat waves or floods. The work that we are doing with uh, farmers who are in our uh, catchment uh, areas in Paris uh, thanks to a financial, a dedicated financial subsidy regime, uh, means that we are hoping that some of these farming practices will aim more at sustainability, reducing the use of nitrates, of pesticides. This, in turn, should enhance the resilience of our territories uh, that Paris is so dependent on for our water resources. In other words, we want a better absorption of water in the, when uh, storms occur. We want to be, limit the uh, impact of uh, f high water floods, uh, the pressure on the Marne and the Seine that are the two rivers uh, upstream of Paris. And we also wish to sustainably uh, improve the quality of uh, our water resources. The next slide, please. How is uh, uh, Paris actually contributing to the refreshing of Paris? Climate change in Paris has multiplied uh, the frequency of uh, climate or extreme meteorological uh, situations, heat waves, uh, torrential rain, flooding. Faced with these new risks, Paris has to adapt. It has to be resilient. This is now a top priority in all of our public policies. The rolling out by the Eau de Paris of uh, twofold fountains, fountains that one can drink from and fountains with a spray function, is one of the responses to refreshing the city. In cities such as uh, Paris, we have a lot of uh, minerals, and it's important to have uh, these types. Uh, so, so we, uh, the, there are a lot of uh, um, heat, zo extreme heat zones. There's also been a lot of work that's been done over the centuries. The Osmanian work that was done uh, in building boulevards in Paris. Uh, a lot of this uh, planning is uh, an advantage for vegetalization, for the uh, enhancing of biodiversity and the encouraging of nature in cities. Paris is one of the uh, few cities that actually has a big network of non-drinkable water with 1,700 uh, kilometers of uh, groundwater. It's a sober network because it uh, does not consume as much energy, uh, not a lot of carbon dioxide, so it's a 
major advantage uh, to fight against these heat waves that are affecting more and more our uh, cities and that are going to accelerate uh, in the years to come, particularly between now and 2050. So this network, as I said, will allow us uh, to green our city, to uh, water these plants, which will f uh, cool down the city, and it's one way of coping with the changes, climate changes in our territories. So that was what I wanted to talk to you about in Paris and what we are doing in Paris, our actions, our policies that are done to try to counter climate change. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Monsieur Lert. especially towards uh, adapting to, to climate change as uh, one of the priorities uh, uh, taken into account by the city. We know we live in Paris, so we know about these uh, very hot waves and uh, the, the fact that uh, working on water means, uh, as uh, it has been highlighted also through other presentation, the fact that uh, water is not just a sector. So we're talking about here biodiversity, we're talking about uh, uh, climate change adaptation, um, and you mentioned a, a series of uh, collaboration with uh, uh, different actors, including, for example, farmers and uh, uh, important role that water will be having also during the Olympics. So uh, a range of uh, activities, uh, pr priorities in relation to adaptation to climate change. So thank you very much for uh, sharing this uh, series of uh, uh, information and initiative and I'm sure that during the discussion, we will be also receiving questions to dig a little bit uh, deeper into what you just uh, described. I will now try to go back to Mr. Arayu, Manuel Arayu, mayor of Kelimani City. Let's see if we have been able to fix the technical issue we had just uh, about 10 minutes ago. Uh, Mr. Arayu, can you now hear me? Not yet. I'm not sure we are able to hear. Okay. Ah, oh, I can I can see you. Mr. Arayu, can you hear me now? Yes, I, I can hear you very well. Perfect. Yes, we can hear you. So oh, the floor you. is yours. So thank you very much for your patience. Oh, thank you very, very much. And I'm really sorry for the te technical problem. Well, Oriana, I just really want to thank you very much for inviting us to be part of this uh, platform because we find it uh, as a very useful platform where we not only share our own experience, but also we learn a lot. And I'm also very pleased that uh, OECD and the UNESCO are really doing this great job for us, creating a platform where mayors and local governments can really come and learn and their experience. By saying Kalimani is a coastal city, but also it's a, a port city with about 500,000 inhabitants. And uh, the issue of uh, water management and water access is really a great challenge. Actually, we get our drinking water, uh, the source of our drinking water is, uh, uh, is about 50 to 70 kilometers from Kelimani because the area where Kelimani is and because Kelimani is a coastal city, actually, we, if you dig more than one or two meters, you find salt water. So it's very difficult to find fresh water in the surroundings of Kelimane. Therefore, it's really a priority in our policy making. So the existing hydrological potential of Kelimane Municipal, uh, in our views that you know, there are many opportunities to the practice mostly of uh, fishing in, in, in industry, but also we think that there, there is a potential for improving the health and using water to improve 
our economy. Uh, we have a large uh, set of enterprises working in the surroundings of Kilimani on fishing activities. So like the number one economic source for our city comes from fishing. Therefore, for us, water access, water accessibility, and actually water management, it's of a paramount importance for the management of our city. Our vision, the Kilimani Municipal vision on water and marine resources uh, spreads for a wide range of projects. We are implementing an ongoing project for the betterment of the public space beside the out river port. Uh, and this project involves the rehabilitation and the construction of a river bank on the Rio dos Bons Sinai, which is the river that surrounds Kelimane city. Actually, this is mainly for leisure time. We also, we are constructing open space houses for residents in the surrounding area in order to attract tourism in the marginal, in the front desk. We are working in two major projects. One is called Kelimane Limpa, and the other one is called Kelimane Agricola. But also we have a third one, which we call, well, I mean, it uh, is a mangrove restoration project. Because as I mentioned before, uh, the main economic activity in our city and for our citizens is fishing. So we do care about the health of the mangrove forest that surrounds our city. Mangroves play two important roles for our city. One is protecting our city from erosion, while the second is that mangroves uh, are the place where fish and uh, other marine resources do reproduce themselves. For example, shrimps, the famous Mozambican shrimps that, you know, they come from the coast of Kelimane and actually they grow up and they reproduce them their, themselves on the mangroves. But unfortunately, because of the poverty level of our citizens, what really happened is that uh, our citizens do cut the mangroves either for cooking or for building their own houses. So what we did was to come up with a mangrove restoration project that includes teaching our citizens on the importance of the mangroves. But by now they actually tell us, we understand the importance, but what are the alternatives for us? We understand the mangroves are very important for our livelihoods, but what are the alternatives? How can we build, build our houses without using mangroves? How can we cook? because we, we, we don't have alternative sources. So in this project, we introduce, actually we are working with the UN Habitat, but also with the with, uh, UN Habitat, yes, and with World Vision, which is a US organization, in designing houses that can be built using local material, but not using mangroves. And uh, we have built the first 10, what do we call, 10 resilient houses. And while the process of building, we invite our citizens to come and learn by doing. So that is a project, is an ongoing project which is going on. The second project is the transformation of solid waste into biogas. So or organic waste into biogas. So the idea is to give them the alternative so, so that they can use biogas instead of cutting mangroves, either for to transform it into coal for cooking or that, that directly for, 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 for cooking. We also uh, face, I mean, we are imp implementing what we call Kelimane Agricola, which we transform organic waste into compost. So by doing that, we are actually solving two problems with one stone. One, we are solving the man management challenge of solid waste. But in the second place, because actually the Kelimane, as I mentioned, is the provincial capital of uh, a 6 million province called Zambezia province. And this is the second biggest pr province in terms of population. But actually the, we are aiming 52% of malnourishment, especially with kids and women. So with this, project where we transform solid waste into compost, we are teaching 
our urban farmers on how to use compost to improve the, the production, but also the productivity uh, 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 on their farms. By doing that, we, uh, we hope that we will be able of tackling the, nu nu the nutrition challenge that uh, we do face in our city. We are also uh, coming up with um, a way, but of course, th this is a very expensive process, but this, given the availability of salt water, we are facing uh, during high tides, we also face uh, an increasing salinization of the soils in, in, in our city. So we, are, we face two kinds of erosion. Er erosion coming from normal rainwater coming from the rainfall, but also uh, we face erosion and uh, salinization of the soils when we have high tides from the sea. So the challenge is here is how can we protect the land, the already scarce land that we have both for building houses and other infrastructure, but also for urban agriculture that we are losing this land because of uh, sal salinization from saltwater uh, tides and uh, waves. We are also building biodigesters and uh, from latrine septic tanks of both from organic solid waste biodigesters uh, to help us improve or produce biofertilizers while also offering additional benefits to family urban agriculture. Uh, the effects that uh, climate change that we face includes, as I mentioned, mangrove destruction, but also trends of temperature increase. Uh, we are having already the impact of irregular uh, yearly season in terms of rainfall, like there is a decrease in the availability of water coming from the rain. We are having long lasting dry seasons. And uh, as I mentioned also, we are having an increasing sea level rise, but also a frequency on tropical cyclones. Only in, in the last two years, we faced two very big cyclones that destroyed most of our infrastructure in our cities. I mean, these are like the examples that we wanted to bring and to share with uh, other cities and other in, in international partners that K Kilimani City is facing. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mayor. Indeed, the Kalimani city uh, is uh, facing exactly what uh, we mentioned in the beginning. So building an economy based on uh, activities that, the re that depend and rely on water. You mentioned the fishery and the very well-known uh, industry related to shrimps in uh, uh, Mozambique and then uh, coming from the Kalimani coast, but also this interaction with the water security problem. You mentioned cyclone, you mentioned uh, uh, water uh, scarcity and uh, the link uh, to salinization of the soil. You mentioned the issue of mangrove that actually are very important for biodiversity, but they have been used for uh, cooking and for housing. So all these projects that you mentioned, Kelimane Limpa, Kelimane Agricola and mangrove restoration project a very important source of inspiration and uh, highlight uh, the importance of connecting a sustainable blue economy with the need of enhancing water security and resilience. So thank you very much for sharing your experience. And without further ado, I will now uh, pass the floor uh, to the city of Barcelona, Anna Mayo Crespo. She is the director of business innovation project uh, in the city of Barcelona, Spain, and actually, while we were managing to uh, set up this uh, amazing panel, Barcelona was uh, one of the unique city that managed to have a blue economy strategy. So uh, please, uh, Anna, now the floor is yours, as we are very curious and keen to learn and to hear from this experience. Please. Hello, everyone, and really thank you, Oriana and OCD UNESCO for the invitation. It's a pleasure for Barcelona to be here and 
to share the work we've been doing the last year, putting the blue economy in really in the Barcelona agenda. Because uh, as I've heard this morning a lot about resilience of cities and also the economic impact of blue economy. And I would like to share how Barcelona put this strategic sector in the economic agenda of the city. We've designed uh, an economic agenda called Barcelona Green Deal. We are talking about different strategic sectors in the city like creative industries or design or digital or sports. And we could not, um, we could not forget about blue economy because we are a, a city with C and the C is an economic engine for the city. So please, uh, next slide, I can begin with the presentation. As I said, Barcelona is a city with C. We have a tradition of sailors and traders and, we, and, and the, the C have been an economic engine. But if we want to keep the C with this role, we need a sustainable C, we need a healthy C because otherwise um, uh, this could not be a, an economic engine. So uh, aligned with the SDGs and with the 2030 agenda, we design what, next slide, what we call the, um, the blue economy strategy for the 21-25. It's a strategy that we've done with all the blue ecosystem of the city that we present just two months ago. And we, have, we, have, we are working with 12 economic sectors in the city. I, I can talk about that later on. And we've designed more than 40 measures and 15 projects to, to make it happen with an investment from the municipal part of 40 million euros, but I'm sure will be increased and will be uh, increased a lot with the collaboration and contribution from many other partners. And also we will develop in this 25, 21, 25, more than 35, thousand square meters or newer renewed for the blue economy. So I would share a video, it's two minutes video, and I think it's the easier and faster way to explain the measure, and then I can explain a little bit the, the details. Thank you. Within the framework of the Barcelona Green Deal economic agenda, and the United Nations Agenda 2030, Barcelona City Council promotes the blue economy as one of the strategic economic sectors for the city. This is done with the support and participation of all public and private entities that are key to the sector. Blue economy is conceived as the set of economic activities linked to aquatic fields, compatible with the conservation of the environment and that foster a sustainable economic and social development. Barcelona City Council sets as objectives in the promotion of the blue economy to generate and strengthen maritime economic activity and employment by boosting innovation and sustainability. To integrate blue economic activity into the social fabric and maritime culture of the city and to promote Barcelona's blue economy both locally and internationally. Eight lines of action have been established ranging from the creation of a blue economy hub the promotion of employment and education in the sector and local and international promotion to the conservation and regeneration of the marine ecosystem. Among the initiatives of each line of action, it is worth mentioning the project for the transformation of the Olympic port, which will be the first blue economy hub in Barcelona, a reference in the fields of marine dissemination, leisure and nautical culture. The new Olympic port will also have spaces for blue sector companies. The promotion of the blue economy also focuses on other projects such as the Nautical Training and Technology Hub, an entrepreneurship programme and a study of new jobs in the sector. In addition, blue economy investment funds will be supported and a blue economy observatory will be created to evaluate the economic, social and environmental impact of the sector in Barcelona. The implementation of these measures will make Barcelona one of the leading cities in blue economy in Europe favouring the sustainable and social economic development of the city. So, yeah. So, as you can see, uh, we have a strategy because uh, if you go to next slide, we really think that Barcelona have the assets 
but also there's a momentum. Blue economy, it's not a term that was created last year or, or, la or last two years, have a 10 years old uh, concept, I would say, but have a momentum uh, that you can see in this slide. I like to share it as a, the economic view. We had two uh, venture capitalists uh, investing in blue economy in in ten, uh, in 2014 in 2010 between 2010 and 2014 and the last years we have uh, uh, it has appeared more than 30 uh, venture capitalists that are investing and have money to invest in this in this sector that means that it's not only that we have to focus on the sustainability um, mm, as a, as, as a mass, of course, for all the cities and for the planet and for the 2030 agenda, but also there's economic opportunity. As, as Aziza said at the very beginning, we are creating jobs and we are creating richness and businesses. So we want to capture all these uh, opportunities for the city. Next slide. So what we, we have for Barcelona and as I said, how, so why Barcelona decided to put blue economy in the agenda? As I say, because we have the sea, but not only that. So we have the location, we have four ports. We, I, I know it's very small. I, I will explain some the, the big um, highlights. I would say it, it's a city with 16 uh, kilometers of coastline and we have four ports, but we have also the port of, of Barcelona. So the one of the biggest uh, European ports uh, in terms of, of um, TEU, but also in terms of passengers. We have Mercabarna talking about fishing and, and we are good on, on this distribution. We also have one of the leading companies on, uh, uh, on uh, repair and refit of, of ships. We have the nautical sector that is really well organized and doing a, a great job in, in, in the city. We have the research uh, and universities and research centers that are creating science uh, recognized globally. And we have the culture. We have the, the, the sports, the leisure. So the city leaves the sea. So, uh, we've measured for the first time, because what is not measured doesn't exist, we wanted to know what the blue economy represents for the city. And we measure, and we are talking about the 4.3% of the GPD in the city and 1.4% uh, of the employment, more than 15,000 employments. So we thought there's a, there's a potential there. In the next slide, what we want to do is to enhance that to, to do what we've done with other sectors like the digital sector, for example, with the Mobile World Congress and we are many um, projects that created Barcelona uh, of um, position. Barcelona is the third uh, city in Europe for creating startups. So prefer for a startup to creating a startup. So we want to do the same with Blue Economy to position the city uh, and, and to create the, this, this environment. I'm not going into the detail of all the access I can do maybe later, but the idea is create companies with the new hub of activity, so entrepreneurship programs, create employment. We are looking at the opportunities in employment, innovation. Our drivers are always innovation and sustainability. We also want to connect this existing economy and reinforce with the city, with the citizens, with the neighborhoods, and we add, and I think it's very important to comment this here, we add an axis talking about conservation and regeneration of the marine ecosystem. Resi the resilience of the city is part of the economic agenda. They have to go hand in hand. We are also working with the local promotion and, and to position internationally, we are uh, working with uh, international networks. And one important thing for us, and is the last, is the governance. For us, it was very important to have a private public governance. We've been talking with more than 70 agents in the city to create the strategy. We share that. And we as city council, we lead some of the projects, but not all of them. We count in, uh, on the involvement of all the private actors, universities, citizens, et cetera. So uh, here you have the link that maybe I can put later on on the chat where you can find all the details of this strategy and with all the projects explained. I'm not sure if this is the last slide. Yeah, so I think this would be the general explanation what we are doing in Barcelona, 
how we define, so how we are tackling the three mm. sustainabilities, the economic, the environmental, and the social, putting blue economy in our economic agenda. Thank you. So thank, thank you very you. much, Anna. That was uh, really uh, inspiring. Uh, I think uh, you basically summarize, uh, or let's say that you close uh, the, the circle, as Isa Akmush started by saying that there is no economic resilience without water resilience. And the example that you provided now, uh, highlighting the resilience of the city is part of the economic agenda. The fact that you mentioned that I have to go hand in hand, uh, I think that very nicely uh, close this, uh, this, uh, this session. Uh, Barcelona uh, um, blue economy strategy builds on the asset that the cities have, but uh, it's uh, very much uh, a matter of identifying this potential, uh, the potential for the blue economy now representing already 4.3% of the GDP and 1.4% of job is very big. And so uh, highlighting this uh, resilience and sustainability circularity approach uh, is, uh, uh, is uh, pretty much keen to develop a sustainable economic growth uh, uh, but also taking into account the uh, issue of water security, protecting for extreme water related event, making sure that the city take into account protection of biodiversity and the marine and uh, land ecosystem. So thank you very much for this because we received a, um, a question, we received a question uh, in relation to what policy decisions uh, the OECD and UNESCO are referring to uh, when we talk about blue economy and water security. My colleague Juliette uh, Lastman shared in uh, the platform the link to the, uh, the OECD project on cities for the blue economy. And you could see that we highlight uh, the what we call a risk proof uh, approach for a blue economy so taking into account uh, uh, resilience inclusiveness which means uh, basically a just transition looking at the jobs but also uh, the inclusiveness of vulnerable people within the designing of the sustainable blue economy in cities we look at uh, the um, uh, sustainability through for example a nature-based solution that can Complement the grey infrastructure, and we look at the circularity of uh, uh, water, which is something that has been also highlighted by Alice from UNESCO in her presentation when it comes to water reuse and uh, how to make sure that the resources are actually uh, taken into account in a valuable way um, and uh, uh, in a, in a sustainable way. Uh, we are also sharing the link to the Barcelona Blue Economy Strategy and uh, that you can find also in the, in the platform. Now, unfortunately, time flies, so I won't have time to uh, ask the questions that uh, I was uh, really burning to ask to all the panelists. Uh, but what I would like to uh, to do and hear uh, from um, uh, from uh, from the panelists, I really, first of all, uh, thank very much all of them because uh, this has been a very inspiring uh, uh, session. I would like to hear from them, perhaps uh, just uh, with a very last uh, sentence, uh, a very last. Uh, thought about uh, how do we manage uh, to make a blue economy in cities that are sustainable and resilient, a wish that you have, an action that you wish to be implemented. So you have uh, literally one minute each, one sentence, a very straightforward, and I will start back uh, from uh, uh, Cassid, Cassid Brenier, just uh, really, what do you wish for, for a blue economy in cities that will be resilient and sustainable? Merci beaucoup, Oriana. Je, je... Thank you very much, Oriana. Well, I think it was a very inspiring session indeed. And uh, 
we need drivers to have a blue economy and to protect oceans. So all cities need to uh, get more mobilized for sanitation, waste management, and also on issues uh, such as uh, nature-based solutions, circular economy. And in all the examples that were presented, we've seen that it's necessary to involve um, population with uh, multi-level governance that's so dear to the OECD in order to uh, uh, be a game changer and to protect uh, the resources that are so important for us. Uh, that's how we will develop uh, such an economy that will produce uh, a great impact and employment. Um, definitely, I mean, UNESCO, um, I, I would have really very much liked to, to talk more about groundwater. I mean, uh, th this is something that we will have uh, to invest uh, and to work more all together in the future. I mean, the role, what is the role of groundwater in making uh, sustainable blue cities and in the blue economy? We have not yet worked very much on that. And, um, and in, in doing that, I mean, of course, so we have uh, facts, we have data. Um, it's uh, it's um, the, the, the number of cities uh, that are depending on groundwater is intensifying and uh, almost more than 50% of the global urban population uh, uh, depends uh, on uh, groundwater for uh, supply of the cities and, and, uh, and drinking supply. So water supply. So definitely we have an opportunity and the opportunity is this year, the UN World Water Day, 22nd of March, will be devoted to groundwater, making the invisible visible. And, and UNESCO will organize at the end of the year a, a UN summit on groundwater here at UNESCO in Paris, I hope in Presencia. Um, having said that, uh, um, we have also other data and facts, uh, how the achievement of the SDG 6, how groundwater can contribute to the achievement of the SDG 6. When we talk SDG 6 means access to water in cities, rural areas, uh, mega cities, etc. And uh, the, the data are telling us that uh, the lack of knowledge, uh, governance and, and management uh, in many regions of the world uh, about uh, groundwater resources, transboundary aquifers in particular, mm. um, is lacking. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alice. We take the point to seize the opportunity to raise awareness uh, on the role of groundwater and also the governance uh, of uh, groundwater. We will be meeting at the ninth World Water Forum in Dakar, Senegal, in March 2022. And there is also another important appointment to take into account, which is the UNESCO Water Conference in 2023. Uh, Mr. Arayo. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I mean, for me, I will really stress on the need of uh, leadership and uh, training. And lastly, inclusion. Those will be like the three most important words. If we don't have a clear leadership, it, it's impossible for us to move. If we don't have uh, inclusion, then we will be leaving others. By others, I mean others, the most vulnerable in our cities, but also others as failed world or developing cities, which need to be included in this dialogue and their voice need to be heard and they need to be on the forefront because we have specific kinds of challenges such as human resources, lack of human resources. Like mm. we do have the challenges, we understand them, but we don't have the human capability to transform mm. the, the challenges into solutions. And lastly, resource availability. Without financial re resources, we may be willing to do things, but we won't have the ability to match what uh, we want to do. Those are Very things we'll straightforward Thank message, you. leadership, capacity building. We're talking about human and financial capacity and inclusion for sustainable blue economies in city. Paris, Mr. Lert. Yes, thank you. I would like to support Manuel Araujo on uh, resilience. It's also a matter of solidarity. The most resilient cities 
are the cities that are the most uh, they have the most solidarity it's uh, better to face shocks to anticipate climate hazards that are extreme so that's what we're working on in paris and the second challenge was actually mentioned a bit earlier which is phase out uh, single use plastics for 2024 our ambition is to be a city with a zero a single waste plastic waste we talked about plastic waste in notions which is a major challenge and we hope with the eau de paris system we hope to come up with solutions in order to limit plastic pollution that comes uh, through the river and to limit this kind of waste uh, that ends up in ocean in the in oceans so major challenges that we can only address with enough solidarity to improve the resilience of our cities and communities. Again, the time zone in which you've mentioned solidarity, but also do more about making our cities zero waste cities and especially looking at the single use uh, plastic. So, thank you very much for making this point, which has been very much highlighted also by AFD at the beginning of uh, Cassil presentation. So, we are very much online. And last but not least, Anna from Barcelona. Many things have already been said. I'll try to add something. Um, maybe my wish would be uh, again talking about generosity and network because uh, we want to see much, much more cities uh, having a strategies and collaborating to make it happen because a network of cities are, are needed. In fact, in Barcelona, we are talking with UNESCO in Ocean City, so that's a project for us. And uh, because the only way to have the resilience and economy going hand by, by hand is to collaborate and to share projects and, and to and 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 I would say blue economy sometimes in some forums thinks that there's a fashion thing. I would say there's not a fashion, it's a must, and we need to all work on that to contribute to, to these three sustainabilities I said before: the economic, the sustainable and the social. So we have the assets, we have Thank the momentum, you. let's do it. Thank you very much. So collaboration uh, uh, and long-term strategies, uh, not to make this uh, something that is trend, but a reality, a concrete uh, engine and source of job, uh, economy, well-being, environmental quality, uh, looking at all the uh, component of the sustainability. So this leads us to the end of this session. Uh, I just, we are two minutes late, but please allow me to thank you once again for your amazing contribution that was an inspiring session and I thank you very much uh, for the participants who are interested in knowing more please don't hesitate to contact us and we will be happy to share any materials and the documentation you might need thank you very much and I pass the floor to UNESCO's colleagues thank you a lot Thank you very much, Mr. Romano, and all speakers for their interesting Thank presentations. You. Thank you, dear participants, Thank for you your much. attention and interest. Stay online. The closing ceremony will begin at 11 a.m. Thank you very much, and I wish you to everyone a good weekend. Water, it's vital to human life, our economy and ecosystem, the very survival of our planet. But water challenges are growing more intense than ever before. Increasingly volatile weather patterns fueled by climate change, crumbling infrastructure, pollution, and overpopulation that's causing a surge in demand for water. But now, New technologies are offering bold new ways to protect and optimize water to help the world become water secure. And Xylem is leading the way. Xylem is a Fortune 1000 global water technology provider dedicated to solving water and smart infrastructure challenges. We have a century long track record of trust and reliability, providing leading edge technologies, expertise, and equipment to utilities 
industrials, and other working closely with our customers to develop solutions that manage water more effectively and efficiently all across the water cycle. Now we're leading the digital transformation of water, partnering with our customers and innovation leaders, discovering new ways to harness the power of data and analytics, delivering unprecedented insight that's optimizing existing water systems, and creating a future that's more water efficient to meet the world's water needs and more energy efficient to protect the environment. Our commitment to sustainability is fundamental to our business strategy, guiding everything from how we design new products to our culture and people. Through our corporate social responsibility program, Watermark, Xylem employees have volunteered more than 230,000 hours over the past five years, educating about key water issues, cleaning up local waterways, working with our NGO partners to deliver drinkable water systems to communities in urgent need, and deploying our experts, technology, and equipment to help disaster-afflicted communities. The world's water challenges are dramatically increasing, but so are the possibilities to solve them. Xylem is working every day to bring water technology and innovation to communities and people around the globe, raising awareness and reaching new audiences through partnerships and the power of sports, and helping create a world where water is more accessible, affordable and safer for all. Water is always moving, and so are we. We're pushing forward, pursuing the opportunity of a lifetime. We're Xylem, and we're solving water. Join us.